Hello, I'm Dr. Torna Pittman. I work for Engender Equality, which is a Tasmanian statewide family violence service. These videos are supported by the Crown through the Department of Communities Tasmania, for which we're very grateful. Tasmania is one jurisdiction in Australia which pays close attention to the course of conduct and the pattern of relating that indicates coercive control in a relation an intimate relationship so welcome to the video four of our coercive control series which is on the tactics of coercive control and stay tuned and i will be right back Back again. I'm going to take you through a PowerPoint on coercive control on the tactics. Um, before I actually go through the PowerPoint, though, I'm going to just show you the program on for the series. And I'm just going to take myself out of the screen so you've got more availability. So the first week's been covered, the introduction, the second the dynamics of coercive control part one and the third the dynamics of coercive control part two the fourth week is this one the tactics of coercive control and the next week is the styles of coercive control week after that is the effects the week after that is the stages then the children and the effects on them and then the post-separation consequences and challenges and finally, transformation, healing, and recovery from coercive control. Coming up is the agenda for today, the tactics. First of all, I'll revisit the first three episodes just briefly. Then I'll discuss some common questions that we get asked about coercive control. I'll go into the cycle of violence and how people with lived experience of coercive control says it describes their experience, um, a cycle of tactics, if you like. And then I'll take you through the confessions of a coercive controller, a client's story and points to remember. There's that web again. Now this web is a rather intricate, beautiful web. It's totally interconnected. You can see every strand is related to every other strand. And whatever happens in one part of that web will affect every other part of the web. And the spider in the middle of the web is the builder of the web. The spider, we could say, has a attitudinal style of superiority, entitlement, and being very adversarial. And it's like a program. It's like the spider is programmed. It's almost like a software program so that the web is built in a certain way to trap and to hold you hostage and to uh, use you as prey. So every strand in that web serves a function. The same as, as in every behavior and coercive control serves a function as well. And it all comes from superior entitled and adversarial attitudinal style. So let's briefly revisit the first three episodes. Important to remember is that coercive control is a patterned misuse and abuse of power in an intimate relationship. It's not a um, it's not a occasional outburst or some poor behavior or a, a major argument or a fallout. It's a pattern and the pattern can be quite low level and beneath the radar are not particularly obvious, but the person who's experiencing it will come off second best and end up looking like a second class citizen in comparison to the coercive controller. In an equal relationship, the odd incident, argument, outburst, um, some poor behavior, a real conflict can generally be resolved and maybe the relationship will grow and develop as a result of the res resolving. <laughs> but in an, a coercive controlling relationship, there is no growth and there's no development. 
and there is no true resolution of any conflict and there isn't actually conflict so much as there is uh, abuse. The dynamics create different gradations of abuse that may or may not reach the level of a crime <clears throat> or a chargeable offence but are nonetheless disempowering and oppressive. So if we have a look at this little clip of gradations of abuse all the way from one to crime people with lived experience say that crime or the sevens and eights can happen from time to time in the relationship but it's all the other gradations that can actually be highly impactful and injurious if not more so than the crime because they are relentless and continual and and ruthless and they don't stop and they strip the person with the lived experience of their identity and their self-esteem and their equality and their autonomy and their agency within the relationship the attitudinal style will bring about boundary and rights violations that will be detectable in every area of the relationship there's no one part of the relationship that's quarantined from the coercion the coercion will have to spread across every part of the relationship in some way, shape or form, depending on the style of the coercive controller. And pivotal to it all will be a very adversarial style of communication, which I call conversational control, because the coercive controller will take over the conversations and turn them to their advantage and to the disadvantage of the victim so that nothing's resolved. There's never a win-win or a compromise. There's more uh, adjustment and accommodation required from the victim to the coercive controller. So here is the web again, and I'm just going to run you through it. The superior entitled and adversarial attitudinal style is at the centre. It's the core of the web. It's, it's the spider. It's what builds the whole web. And it just permeates and infiltrates the whole relationship. It goes through every part. And it brings with it a set of dynamics. First one, conversational control. So every conversation will be controlled, you'll be, uh, the, co the coercive controller will decide if you have the conversation, when, for how long, in what tone, and what conclusion will be reached. And it doesn't match what happens in an equal relationship where you might come to shared plans and agreements and decisions. There's nothing like that. Every conversation, or most of them anyway, uh, the, the coercive controller will take it over and control the architecture of the conversation so that there can be no win-win. And what will happen is that through the conversation, you'll be kept on a continuum of either fear, obligation, guilt or shame. Therefore, you can't have any true emotional intimacy and with someone who's got a superior entitled and adversarial attitudinal style it's impossible to have emotional intimacy because that is not what the coercive controller wants they're not after the intimacy and the growth and the and the getting closer and more connected and more evolved as the years go on what they want is an arrangement where you suit them There'll be intermittent niceties and kindnesses, but no regular um, respect and kindness, which is more characteristic of an equal relationship. And the intermittent niceties are really only to kind of get you to come back under um, the thumb again when you are starting to get a little bit disillusioned and disinterested. There'll be the continual use of fear, obligation, guilt or shame because of the conversational control in particular, just to keep, because when you are on that continuum, you are far more amenable, you are more easily rock and rolled 
and um, made to feel like you have to accommodate the coercive controller. It's a very good way of keeping uh, the person completely unable to stand their ground. There'll be no empathy because anyone who has a superior entitled and adversarial attitudinal style doesn't have empathy for the situations that they put you in, for how they take away your rights, how they subject you to double standards and double binds. They don't have real empathy for that. They don't even really see it as um, something that you should be complaining about. And there'll be the threat of, the fear of, or actual retaliation should you resist any of this. And people with lived experience do resist it. They resist it on many levels and in many ways, but they are completely blocked by the dynamics at one stage or another. So if they try and raise something, they'll get conversational control. If they really want to... Um, take it further, then they might get subjected to a greater and an, in, an increase of fear, obligation, guilt or shame so that they retreat and they are bound back onto, they have to look into themselves as to what have they done wrong this time. So it's just a cycle that goes round and round. Out of that will come a web and a pattern of double standards and double binds, boundary violations, and rights violations and they will make sure that in every area of the relationship there'll be a neglecting, obstructing and overwhelming of your of your rights and your boundaries. Now in the conversational patterns, your communication rights and boundaries will always be neglected, obstructed or overwhelmed and the, de the pattern will depend upon the style of the coercive controller. Some coercive controllers are more neglectful as a rule, some are more obstructing, and some are much more prone to be overwhelming. But there's a general mix of those three um, types of boundary violations, and they can be really fast and almost impossible to tease apart in one interaction. Uh, but what we do know about coercive controllers is that in some areas, for example, in the social arrangements, there are some coercive controllers who are far more micromanaging of their partner's social engagement and whether they're allowed out and who they're allowed to see and who what they're allowed to talk about with others. There are some coercive controllers who really, really use the social arrangements to completely control and others that aren't quite as interested in that and tend to control in other areas more so. So in the um, economic or financial arrangements, you end up being exploited. In the sexual arrangements, you end up being subjugated. In the part of the relationship where you get talked about to others, how you're represented, you'll be alienated if they believe the coercive controller and so many people with lived experience of coercive control have lost friends and community and respect because of the way that they've been defamed um, by their coercive controller. And I call that defamation abuse. And then in the physical relationship, you end up being threatened and experiencing physical abuse because of the way that your boundaries and rights are violated. So that's a really complex web and it's also a complex diagram to get your head around. So I also am going to put it to you this way. If we break the relationship down into six parts, which is what victims say, they talk about mainly talk about their sexual and physical relationship, their conversational patterns, the social and economic arrangements and how they're talked about to others. That's a very common way for um, people with lived experience to break down their relationship when they're, when they're telling their story. So they're going to experience superior entitled and adversarial attitudinal style, double standards where the coercive controller has more rights, 
and doesn't want to be reciprocal or accountable but expects you to be, expects you to give and to, for you to be accountable but they don't have to give it to you. So there's double standards that go right across the relationship and then double binds where you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, where you have to revolve around them but not depend on them, where if they will hurt you and then blame you for being hurt, the different kinds of boundary violations, conversational control, which leads to fear, obligation, guilt or shame and a constant sense of, of having to decide what to do out of one of those. Uh, no empathy or intimacy, just intermittent kindnesses and the threat, fear of or actual retaliation. So common questions about coercive control, um, we get these questions all the time. Question one, is it about anger? Is the coercive controller got an anger problem? And the answer to that is that the anger of a coercive controller is not based on healthy boundaries. Remember, their expectations of you are unfair, irrational and contradictory. Their anger is based on their expectations and it is abusive anger. It's not the anger of someone who's had their healthy boundaries violated. It's the anger of someone who's had their unhealthy expectations not met. Question two, doesn't it take two to tango? Everyone says that. So what's my part in it then? Do I help bring the relationship to this state? The answer to that is not when there is coercive control or abuse. It is entirely one-sided. Takes two might apply to an equal relationship where there is a level playing field, but not where there is a misuse and abuse of power. Question three, am I codependent? That's a very unfair and inaccurate victim blaming term. Coercive control is abuse. You are abused and traumatized, not codependent. There's more on the effects of coercive control in week six. Question four, is it about mental health, stress or alcohol? No, it isn't. These factors can increase the intensity and drama and provide good excuses, but the superior entitled and adversarial attitudinal style is there even when their mental health, stress and alcohol problems are addressed. Is it about their trauma? Well, it can be related, but not all trauma creates a superior entitled and adversarial attitudinal style. Past trauma is no excuse. We can all learn relationship skills despite our trauma. I have worked with couples where the one partner was far more traumatized than the other and the partner with less trauma was blaming their coercive controlling behaviors on their trauma even though even though it was put to them that the partner that they were controlling was far more deeply traumatized than they were not only by what had happened in their history but by what was going on in the actual relationship Question six, why didn't I see this in the beginning? Well, it isn't always possible to see it at the beginning. Many types of boundary violations can be outside of our awareness or experience. The start of the relationship is often showing great promise of equality and intimacy. So now I'm going to take you through the cycle of violence. This was first discovered by the research of Lenore Walker in 1979. She, in those early stages of family violence research where they really were still focusing on physical violence, she interviewed a lot of women, I think it was 187, to find out what else was happening in, in the relationship apart from the physical violence. What else went on and she discovered one of the many things she discovered in her research was that there was a cycle of violence that had three stages now this has been evolved over time but um her first stage is the tension building phase which where the batter is moody nitpicking isolating her withdraws affection yelling drinking or drugs threats and destroys property and the victim response might be to attempt to calm him or her nurture stay away from family and friends 
pacifies, keeps kids quiet, agrees, withdraws, tries to reason, cooks favourite dinner, a general feeling of walking on eggshells. The second phase is the explosion phase where the batterer may hit, choke, humiliate, imprison, rape, use of weapons, verbal abuse and throwing things. And the victim response might be to protect themselves and children, to call the police, try to stay calm, try to reason, leaves and fights back. And then the honeymoon stage or the remorse phase is where the batterer is very sorry and begs for forgiveness, promises to get counselling, sends flowers and presents and declares they'll never do it again and how much they love her. And the victim's response is to agree to stay, return or take him back, attempt to stop legal proceedings, sets up counselling appointments for him, feels happy and hopeful. Now, there are many critics of this cycle. Uh, it does describe, I'm sure, an element of coercive control and family violence, but not every uh, person with lived experience of coercive control experiences three different phases like that. Um, and certainly many, many victims don't have much of a honeymoon or a remorse phase. If they do, it's very short or not present at all. Um, and for some people, an explosion phase can be um, um, much broader than than what is in this particular diagram. It can be a range of emotionally abusive incidences, but it's nonetheless an explosion. And other people with lived experience don't experience a hell of a lot of attention building phase at all. It can be very um, surprising. The explosion can be surprising and out of the blue and unexpected. However, for many people with lived experience of course of control they can see these this cycle of violence so take a listen to dr phil who's trying to explain to a young woman who's been brought in by her very worried mother that what she's going through is this very cycle of violence you're describing a cycle of violence here and you guys didn't invent it it's it's very well entranced it's it's definitely a, a cycle of violence and you know robin deals with domestic violence all the time she works with women that are caught in this trap all the time she's created a whole curriculum about this and robin let's talk about this if, if you will help me here, number one, tension building, right? This is when it starts building up and the tension starts to rise, correct? That's right. Uh -huh. You start feeling the tension. There's this, it's in the air. Uh -huh. Anxiety starts to build, right? Behavior starts to change. Uh, yes, you can feel it. You can see the, the abuser change his behavior in this case. Uh, starts changing the way he speaks to her, starts blaming her for him being so agitated. Yes. Right. And then number two in the cycle, just so we know, number two is the incident. Any type of abuse occurs. It might be physical, sexual, uh, emotional, whatever. Yes. Sometimes she'll, the, the abuser will have one go-to abuse to start with, and then it leads to all the others. But yes, Usually okay. they'll have one where he just hits her or starts speaking to her in a derogatory way. And again, like I said, telling her it's her fault. She's the one that has a problem. All right. And then number three in the cycle is this is uh, the making up. This is when they try to undo everything, right? right? Right. I'll never do it again. I'm sorry. Again, you made me do it. I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, please forgive me. That'll never happen again. That's not who I am. Okay. And then the fourth, you come around, and then this is the calm after the storm. Right. Then everything is just normal, right? Right. It's right. like it never happened. To show her this is really who I am. I'm not that person. Okay. This is really and who I am. And then you go back to number one, tension starts building. Right. Then the abuse. The, I mean, it's a circle. It just goes around and around and around. And when you described to me what was going on, 
And even when he described to me what was going on, this is exactly what you were describing, correct? Correct. Does each of those distinctly happen with you? Yes. So we didn't make this up for you to, to describe what was happening with you. This was put together uh, based on research across years and years and years of the way abusers interact with their partners. You just happen to fit it like a key in a lock. So that's what's happening with you. You recognize this? Oh, yes. Yes. Now, and here's the thing. It tends to get worse, not better, if something doesn't happen to change it. <laughs> Dr. Phil, he's got a way with words. So just before I go into the confessions of a coercive controller, the, um, the web of abuse actually exists even if there are cycles within that web and there may be all kinds of different cycles there may be that exact cycle of violence that was described just then by dr phil but the web of abuse stands firm and the cycle may go on within it but the web is still there underneath it all um, despite everything and even underneath any honeymoon period or any calm phase, that web of abuse, that web of dynamics is still being played out just in a different way. I'm going to take you through now the confessions of a coercive controller. This has been put together after working with many men who are coercively controlling and also reading the research around the mindset of a course of controller and listening to our own clients with lived experience of coercive control. And the reason why I want to talk to you about the confessions of a course of controller is because once you understand the mindset, then you can be freed from it. You can see it as like a software pattern, a web that's entrapping, and you can see it for what it is rather than being caught in the web and struggling with it and wasting a lot of energy trying to get the approval, the love, the connection with a spider who has an attitudinal style that is not prone to giving you anything remotely resembling an equal relationship where you're going to have emotional intimacy and equality and even emotional safety and fun and growth and where you can flourish. So going back to the three boundaries, the avoiding and disregarding and being completely indifferent to your needs and rights, you're turning away from you, being deaf to you, or blocking you in some way, thwarting you, obstructing you in what you want to do, if it doesn't suit them, or actually overpowering you in some way, shape or form. So here we are. When it suits me and my agenda for the moment, my tactic could be to shut you out, freeze you out, walk out, disappear, deny it ever happened, say I can't remember, refuse you time to discuss anything and withhold the actual information, reassurance or explanation which I know would help you out or the situation out. I will regularly refuse to acknowledge, listen, respond, discuss, engage or negotiate with you or to take up my responsibilities in the relationship to make sure that it functions safely and equally for both of us. I will abandon you rather than engage with you. What's more, I will blame you for doing all of that. When it suits me and my agenda for the moment, I will throw you off balance and obstruct any resolution or connection by using guilt-inducing behaviours, acting very distressed, disappointed or victimised so that you will cater to me. Or I might use my favourite charm technique to get you to accommodate and adjust to me. Another tactic that comes naturally to me is to blame and deflect everything back onto you or make things complicated and confusing by twisting and turning, using mind games, going round and round in circles, subject, 
subjecting you to monologues and generally using a variety of smoke screens and mirrors to thwart you from getting me to address the actual issue you are trying to raise with me. I know how to thwart you because I know how to deflect back onto you in a way that sends you into self-doubt, guilt and confusion and unable to realise that I have just experienced expertly spun you off topic and put the focus back on you it is easy to resolve conflict this way i am not interested in making the relationship emotionally safe or connected in a split second without any preamble or lead up if it suits my agenda i might up the ante and simply overpower you by using well-aimed and well-timed threats that can be veiled or direct I will intimidate and force you with my words, body language and behaviour to accept any way that I decide to deprive you, define and defame you, regulate you, monitor and micromanage you, restrict you, shame and punish you. I will use overpowering and dominating tactics rather than relate with you. It depends upon my style, how much of this I do and in what areas of the relationship I like to micromanage. But in general, I know that you do not like to see me disapproving, disgusted or angry with you, so you will submit. You will also fear my retaliation. With my own special mix of these three boundary violating techniques, I've got you covered. The relationship is an arrangement that suits me. The Duluth model is a very well-loved model of family violence. Um, and it depicts the tactics of family violence and of coercive control. The core of it is power and control. That's where I put superior entitled and adversarial attitudinal style, which brings the power, the need for power and control. So the tactics are, if we start at the top right, using intimidation, making her afraid by using looks actions, gestures, smashing things, destroying her property, abusing pets and displaying weapons. So anything to intimidate. Using emotional abuse, putting her down, making her feel bad about herself, calling her names, making her think she's crazy, playing mind games, humiliating her and making her feel guilty. Using isolation, controlling what she does, who she sees and talks to, what she reads, where she goes, limiting her outside involvement and using jealousy to justify actions, minimising, denying and blaming, making light of the abuse and not taking her concerns about it seriously, saying the abuse didn't happen, shifting responsibility for abusive behaviour, saying she caused it, using children, making her feel guilty about the children, using the children to re relay messages, using visitation to harass her, threatening to take the children away, using male privilege, treating her like a servant, making all the big decisions, acting like the master of the castle, being the one to define men's and women's roles, using economic abuse, preventing her from getting or keeping a job, making her ask for money, giving her an allowance, taking her money, not letting her know about or have access to family income, using coercion and threats, making and or carrying out threats to do something to hurt her, threatening to leave her, to commit suicide, to report her to welfare, making her drop charges, making her do illegal things. Now this wheel, this um, wheel of tactics is really relevant to victims of coercive control and it appears to end or include physical violence and sexual violence. So critics of this model say that that's not always true, that the tactics can go on for years and years and years without there ever being an incident of physical violence or sexual violence. So that's where people like Claire Murphy, Dr. Claire Murphy has created her own um, wheel which is for a start gender neutral so that any gender can relate to it. And also she's included a couple of extra tactics as well, which I think are really important. So if we start at number one, 
She calls them one-sided power games and then mind games and using restrictions and isolation and cyber abuse and technology, technological abuse, which can be used to completely stalk and monitor and surveil a person in every area of their life, using unkindness and violations of trust, using degradation, using separation abuse, using social institutions, denying and minimising and blaming her, them, using the children, economic abuse, sexual abuse, threats and intimidation, domestic slavery and physical violence. Now, Claire Murphy has a website where she goes into and explains in great detail what she means by each tactic. So if you're interested there, her website is, um, is HTTPS speakoutloud.net. So now I'm going to take you to a, a short client story which focuses on this client's sexual relationship with her partner. Her name, her, not her real name, is Kit. Kit would wake up at night and find that her partner was pushing himself upon her. She objected and his comeback was that if she wasn't going to be a good sexual partner for him, he would have to look elsewhere. Then he would ask her where else she was getting it and accuse her of having an affair. In the middle of the night, this was exhausting and debilitating and eventually Kit learned to comply so as not to upset him and because she felt obligated and also a bit afraid as to what would happen if she didn't. Giving in also meant that she could get back to sleep to deal with the busy day ahead. Her partner left most of the responsibilities to her. Kit wore the guilt her partner gave her that she was not a good enthusiastic sexual partner. It didn't really occur to her whether her partner was meeting her own needs or that he was not being sexually respectful. She was far too guilty, tired and confused to see the bigger picture. Now Kit um, had no idea that that was actually sexual abuse. And she was really worried that she was not a good sexual partner and why didn't she feel more sexually interested. And it took a little bit of work with her to help her to understand that when you're being subjected to a web of dynamics and abuse and tactics, the last thing you are going to want to have is sexual interactions with your partner because that's the part that closes down when all those other things are so unequal and disrespectful and unfair. So how the attitudinal style can play out in the sexual relationship is enormous. It can make you, for example, it can play out in that the tactic might be to make you watch or mimic pornography, wanting performance rather than connection, withholding sexual win-wins, placing an unhealthy and unfair focus on the sexual part of the relationship, putting your body down, comparing your body and sexuality to other people of your gender, denying you sexual well-being, accusing you of affairs, calling you sexually derogatory names, giving you a sexually transmitted disease, being sexually disrespectful, and sexual ownership, jealousy and control, subjecting you to sexual double standards and double binds, making demands as to how often you have sex, taking sexual photos and video of you without your consent, anything you don't want but are guilted, obligated, frightened or shamed into doing, treating you badly and still expecting sexual favours from you, not seeking your pleasure, not seeking your sexual needs or wants, making sex a one-way performance, refusing you any affection, attention or focus, overwhelming you with sexual demands, accusing you of being promiscuous, frigid or boring, etc., sexually assaulting you, insisting on sex, sexual coercion, reproductive coercion, so forcing you into having children, not having children, having abortions, not having an abortion, not being allowed any contraception, lewd comments, sexual put-downs, having sexual relationships behind your back, 
unwanted touching comments and suggestions, deciding how the sexual relationship should go, but not asking you what you think. So that is how the attitudinal style can play out in the sexual relationship. There are so many different um, levels of abuse there. There is all the way from one to a crime. So one might be unwanted touching comments or suggestions. Um, the crime is sexually assaulting you. And there's everything in between. And all of it is really a sex, is sexual abuse and uh, a violation of your rights and boundaries in the sexual relationship. So from this PowerPoint today, there are a few points I'd really like you to take away with you. Not only is there a web of dynamics and a web of abuse, there's also a web of tactics. There might be a cycle within that. There may be a cycle of violence and a, you know, where there's a tension build up and then an explosion and then a remorse phase that does not work for every person with lived experience of coercive control. But within the web of tactics, there can be cycles of many kinds. And it all originates from the attitudinal style and they played out in the conversations and the behavioural style and every area of the relationship. Now, some of these tactics are fast, reactive, shifting, shocking, surprising and really unpredictable. And they can just happen out of the blue and knock, knock you sideways. You, you didn't see it coming. Whereas other tactics are slower, more chronic, ever-present and, and much more predictable. So a cycle of violence might be made up of, of both of those. So a web is very complex. It, it will include a cycle of violence for some people and not for others. And it will include some tactics for some people and not the same tactics for other people. So every person's experience will be different. Uh, it will depend upon the style of the coercive controller. And I go into all the different styles next week. Come to the end of the presentation. I want to thank you for watching and listening today. And um, I want to mention that we are supported by the Crown through the Department of Communities Tasmania. It's been lovely to have you here today. I hope you've got something out of this presentation and that it's helping you make sense of coercive control and ways that you can either help yourself or someone else that you care about or maybe one of your clients that are experiencing it. I look forward to seeing you next week. Um, please feel free to like or share these videos. If you want to contact us about anything, the details are coming up. We'd love to hear from you, especially if you have any questions or suggestions or, or anything that you're concerned about. So stay well and stay safe and bye-bye for now.